Today we are cutting our introductory session short for the purpose of honoring a member of the breast cancer family and community who died sadly a couple of weeks ago, Evelyn Lauder, a businesswoman, philanthropist, photographer, and known best to this audience, the founder of the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Since this is the largest annual breast cancer meeting, and since many of the researchers in the audience have benefited from her fundraising efforts and research grants, we felt it especially appropriate to honor Evelyn at this venue. Evelyn died of ovarian cancer after surviving breast cancer more than a decade earlier. I know many of you read about her successful career in the newspapers recently, but I wanted to highlight some of her accomplishments here and then have Larry Norton, who worked closely with her for two decades, say a few words on a more personal level. Evelyn was born in Austria and with her parents fled during the occupation to the United States and specifically to New York City where she was educated and spent her entire career. She first worked as a teacher in public schools, married Leonard Lauder, the son of Este Lauder, and then joined the family business where she had an illustrious career herself. Active on many boards in the city, including the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. In 1989, she led efforts to establish the best ca breast cancer treatment center at Memorial, which was and is world famous for its outstanding patient care and research. In 1992, together, together with the editor of Self Magazine, Alexandra Penny, she launched the pink ribbon, the thing that we always wear on special occasions as the universal symbol of breast health and awareness. Always thinking, Evelyn realized that there was a connection between women's beauty, which was of course the focus of the SD Lauder companies, and women's health. And so she convinced the company to adopt breast cancer awareness as a priority in their social responsibility programs. In 1993, she founded the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, or BCRF as all of us know and uh, know it by, and she named Larry Norton, a friend of mine from our days uh, as a postdoc at the NCI back in the 1970s, as the scientific director. The focus of grant funding from the start was translational, patient-focused research, and she had the unique approach of giving the researcher considerable flexibility and latitude in their breast cancer research efforts. A year later, after starting the BCRF, the organization gave out research grants totaling $159,000 uh, to eight researchers, a rather modest beginning, to something that would become one of the major private breast cancer research funding agencies in the world. The foundation, with Evelyn and Larry at the helm, grew quickly, and in 2001 funded its first international grant, and by 2004, BCRF had raised $100 million in total funds since its inception 11 years earlier. At the most recent fundraising luncheon in October of this year, an event in which Evelyn was notably absent, sending chills down the spine of many of us who knew there must be something dreadfully wrong to prevent her attendance, BCRF awarded $36.5 million in grants to 186 researchers from 13 countries around the world. And now a total of $350 million has been raised for research since that modest beginning in 1993. Before I hand this over to Larry, I wanted to give you one anecdote about the kind of person Evelyn Lauder was. About six years ago, our breast center administrative offices at Baylor uh, relocated to a new area in the medical school. I don't even know how Evelyn heard about it, but we have a long hallway just entering the door into the suite of offices that was suffering from bare white walls. Not long after, a very large package arrived in the breast center with a series of 12 beautiful photographs of flowers all framed and ready to display. These photos soon decorated our entrance. I pass them every morning, going to work, and am reminded daily of Evelyn's many contributions, not only to our research, but to her ability to make the world a more beautiful place to be. All of us, especially her wonderful team at the BCRF, some of whom are here today, uh, we'll miss her very much. And on behalf of all of us at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, please accept our condolences. Now, let me introduce Larry, 
obviously a world-renowned breast cancer researcher himself and the scientific director of the Breast Cancer Research Foundation to say a few words. Larry? Yeah, there you are. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, let me, let me thank uh, the symposium, ACR underwriting the symposium, involved with the symposium, and everybody involved with this for giving us the opportunity to, to make these comments and to, uh, and to speak uh, here today. You, you've heard the details, and the details themselves really contain a lot of the essence of what we're really, what we're really talking about, too. To Evelyn, uh, the beauty field was not about <clears throat> denial. <clears throat> it, it was about defiance. Uh, defiance of physical imperfections, defiance of age, um, uh, and she saw the, our struggle as a defiance against, against illness. She, she also brought something else really remarkable, several remarkable things, and, and, and I will just mention a few uh, you know, to the struggle that I think are, are not readily apparent until they're pointed out. She, she came from a very commercial field, obviously, um, and uh, you know, the, the job of the beauty industry is to basically sell products, um, but, but there is uh, very strong similarities between the world that she came from and the world that we're in. And this, this all came out in discussions that we had very early on, and, and really we spoke every two or three days for more than 22 years, uh, so that uh, the loss is very deep and personal for me. Um, it came out of conversations that we had about what's really needed in the struggle against, against cancer. And uh, from that discussion, something that everybody in this room will appreciate, what was really needed was what we now call translational medicine. Uh, Patient-oriented research, it could be clinical trials, it could be using materials from, from, from the clinic, it could be uh, doing basic science that was relevant to the generation of patient-oriented research. But that was what was really needed when, when we started with this, this basic idea. And she said it's very, very similar to the world that I'm in because the world that I'm in, you know, our job is to give people what they want. And, um, and if people want cure and prevention of breast cancer, that's what we really have to deliver to them. So it makes a lot of sense that no matter how exciting science is, if it's not directed in some way um, toward, toward the ultimate goal, it's not something that we should support. And we should focus exclusively on the research, which is something that makes BCRF really special, and not dilute um, any of the fundraising or any of the resources into other areas, even though they are extremely important, like, like um, uh, outreach um, and like education. These are very, very important areas. The major focus has to be really on the research. And she said that what you have to accomplish in my world um, is to give people really what they want, is you really need two things. You need, and, and they both are uh, essential for creativity. We're dealing with a very creative enterprise, and to have creative people do what they do best, you have to give them money, and you have to give them freedom. And so the organization was really oriented toward raising as much money as we can ethically, and then giving it to people so that they could really follow their muse in directions that are not specific. Bob Warrenberg really said it best at an early meeting. He said that the BCRF supports people, it doesn't support projects. Um, creative people may have to change what they do, and specific aims can sometimes tie you up in a certain direction that you don't want to move in. And so, and so that was really the, the orientation. Now, she had had breast cancer, which was cured more than 20, 20 years ago. And so we had discussions. I've never actually said this publicly before. We've had discussions about should we really tell people about that. And she says we shouldn't because I don't want this enterprise about me. I want this about our common goals. And if I come public because I'm a very visible person, having had breast cancer, it all becomes about congratulating me for my survival or pity for me because I've had breast cancer. And I don't want this about me. I want this about our collective goals, and I want to keep it at the highest levels. I want to keep it on the levels of, of science. And, and I know that when, when Kent mentioned that she got ovarian cancer, and she uh, had advanced ovarian cancer four and a half years ago and eventually succumbed to it, I just want to say to this audience, no BRCA1, no BRCA2, no known genetic susceptibility. I know it popped into everybody's minds um, when, when it happened. I want to make this very clear. It, exhaustively studied by the best people in the field, and it wasn't, and it wasn't uh, associated. Um, uh, and she struggled with that, but never changed the direction of the BCRF, and always kept it at the highest possible level that she could possibly achieve using all of her various tools of fundraising and communications to give us the, the freedom and the resources to move forward. And the bottom line here is that it's all about her confidence in us, her confidence in our ability as dedicated physicians and as dedicated scientists uh, to make progress if we have the tools. 
uh, not directed, not saying you must do this, not saying you must please anybody except the people who need us, which is the people with cancer. And that feeling of confidence in us is something that we can never really forget. Now, those of you who have seen our home, it, the, the first thing that impresses you in New York City, and she had several homes, they all had the same kind of aura, uh, was the quality of the artwork, uh, you know, Klimt and Leger and, and Picasso especially. But as soon as you go into the private areas, it was all filled with books. From floor to ceiling, books everywhere. She was an avid reader and she absorbed everything. She, she read in German and French as well as, as in English and she was very, very erudite. But it all boiled down to her, to the simple adage that comes from the Abrahamic tradition, that uh, your goal is to heal the world and your job is not necessarily to complete that task, but nor are you permitted to abandon it. And with her loss, what we have to do is make sure that we don't abandon that goal. We have to make sure that we still move in the direction of helping the people who need, need our help. And we have to do it with as much freedom as we can get in this very difficult economic environment. And we have to do it with as much creativity as we can bring to the task um, and, and keep our eyes on what really has to be achieved and sort of put some of the surrogate markers where they belong. The papers published, the academic advancement, uh, the awards. Those are surrogate markers of achievement. She, was, she, she got an award every two weeks, I think, for the entire time that I knew her. And she was always appreciative of, of those awards, but she always kept them in perspective. The important thing was achieving stuff to help people. That is the real goal. Everything else are important surrogate goals, but we have to keep that in mind. And if we keep that in mind as a community and as a symposium, we're going to hear some fantastic stuff the next few days, um, I think that we are going to honor her the best way that we can honor her by making the progress that she dedicated more than 20 years of her life to allow us to make. Thank you all very much.